Hello, welcome to the second day of our UbiMoves workshop. Today we're going to have some presentations of papers. First, uh, we're going to play the videos that the author sent us. And then after we open up for questions for uh, of the audience. So if you have any questions to the authors, you should write on the YouTube chat. Um, first, we have of renouncing to do something grandiose of Guido Kramam of the University of Bradenburg. Then we have the potential role of the Internet of Musical Things in therapeutic applications, uh, written by Joseph Cimone, Damien McEvo, McEvoy, and Azima Yassin from the Maynooth University. Then we have Musical Smart City, Perspective on Ubiquitous Sonification, written by Pedro Sarmento, Ove Holmquist, and Matthew Bartet from the Queen Mary University of London. And then Everyday Use of the Internet of Musical Things, Intersections with Ubiquitous Music. Romulo Vieira, Flavio Schiavoni from the Federal University of São João del Rey, and Matthew Bartet from the Queen Mary University of London. So uh, now Leandro is going to have there's some announcements to do. And after we're going to send uh, show, watch the videos and then open up for questions of the authors. Have a good meeting. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, some quick announcements here today. Uh, first, if you need a certificate for today's session, then you have to follow the link that I posted here on YouTube chat. Uh, second, uh, yesterday talk, uh, Joe used some examples to illustrate, uh, which was great, but uh, people who own the rights of the Jim Hendrix uh, songs was not so happy about it, and they blocked our uh, video. And so we are trying to deal with that to unblock the video. Uh, otherwise, we have to remove the examples. Okay. So uh, in case you're not able to, to see the video right now at our channel, it is because we are dealing with that. Uh, some people also email us saying that they were having issues at in making questions uh, using the YouTube chat. Uh, it's not something that we can control here, unfortunately, but we have an alternative way for you to do it. You can do it by our Facebook page. The link is also on our YouTube chat. It's just UBMOOS2020 on Facebook. Then you can send the message there using the messenger, and I'll be monitoring that. The third way, uh, you email me, all right? So right now my email there as well. If you have any questions, you can email me as well. So three different ways for you to interact with today's talk. Okay, uh, I'll ask now Victor to play the the videos. All the videos will be in English except the last one that will be subtitled uh, in English. After that, we we'll go for demonstrations and the live chat with the authors. Thank you, Victor. Roll out the videos, please. Victor, quite so those videos. To just unmute your microphone, please. Victor? Hello everybody, my name is Guido Kramann and I'm a professor for mechatronics at Brandenburg University of Applied Sciences in Germany. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to present my composition method AOG, Arithmetic Operation Grammar, in this meeting. It is a very basic thing. It is characterized by the fact that it conveys a little of my own artistic personality, 
but offers an even broader basis to enable especially laymen to compose. For this reason, at some point, the title On Renouncing Grandiosity was given. I've given some thought to the side from which I should approach the subject and think it makes sense to say a few more general words about what it means to look for an easy way to compose. Put simply, simplicity is always simplicity for someone. When the doorbell rings, getting up and opening the front door is easy. It's easy when you have concepts of front door and doorbell at the front door, when you can walk and when you have healthy limbs. Because this is generally the case with the vast majority of people, we say it is easy. Composing music is not an easy task for most people because It requires years of study in music theory and practical knowledge in the use of musical instruments. Most people, however, consider arithmetic on integers as something simple. However, this is mainly because most of us have learned and practiced mathematics at school for more than a decade. And with that, I have already arrived at the introduction of AOG. In AOG, music theory is replaced by arithmetic. So, something is used that more people know. So, most people will find the basis of AOG to be something simpler than the elements of classical music theory like harmony or counterpoint. However, it should not be forgotten that although the representation of compositions with AOG is done in simple symbols, it makes sense to use a computer to display or play the music represented by the formulas. Furthermore, AOG does not allow to copy any existing musical styles easily. The basic principle of AOG is to use a basic element that has musical characteristics and to transform it. Perhaps the most surprising thing is that this basic element is simply the natural numbers. To give you an impression of how surprisingly simple this method is, I will now present it without further ado. Explanations why it can work at all will follow. Basic element is any gapless part of natural numbers, seen as a sequence of time with constant increment delta t. So, in the simplest case, t equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Composing is done by applying arithmetic operations to this basic element, like this. A modified sequence x results from t. Decimal places in the results of these operations are neglected. For the sake of simplicity, the operations are always applied to the previous result in their natural order. Percent means modulo. To obtain several voices, several such formulas can be applied in parallel. A sequence of the frequencies to be applied by a musical instrument is now obtained from the sequence X in the following way. The operation slash slash represents a selective division. From a constant base number B, 
only the powers of the prime factors 2, 3, 5 and 7 occurring in X are removed from B as long as it is possible. If B is 2 by 2 by 2 by 3 by 3 by 5 by 7, that is 2520. And if the current value of X can be represented as X equals 2 by 2 by 7 by 13, then B slash slash X equals 2 by 3 by 3 by 5. As pseudocode or as C or Java program, the implementation of this selective division looks like this. In the first line, you see the definition of the base number. The loop here goes through a part of the natural numbers and the arithmetic operation are done in this line and result in x. For each x appearing, now the selective division is done by setting first a frequency to base number and then checking if as well in x as well in f still the prime factor 2 is present and if so dividing both by 2 as often as possible and doing the same with 3, 5 and 7. The remaining rest in F is then interpreted as a frequency which is played by an instrument if this frequency is in between the range of the frequency which can be played by these instruments. Delay 200 says here that this loop is um, done in time steps of 200 milliseconds. To give you a more vivid impression of the potential of AOG, I will now use a demonstration um, sketch done with processing using a special library I added to processing Composing for Everyone, which is available in contributed libraries at processing.org and uh, which provides a possibility to write AO um, code, which is in a simple editor, uh, which is interpreted in the sense of AOG. And every time I change something here, it will apply to the program. So I start it and um, um, <clears throat> The meaning of the first line is uh, starting t with 0 in steps of 200 milliseconds. The next three lines define three instruments, xylophone, vibraphone, marimbaphone, whereas um, these are the MIDI ranges of each instrument. Here is a channel and this is the panning and the first numbers represent the potencies or the exponents of the basic numbers for 2, 3, 5 and 7. So this means 2 power 3, 3 powers 2, 5 powers 1, 7 powers 1 and a factor is added. The next three lines represent the arithmetic operations done to T and automatically after this the selective division is done and it is interpreted as a, a frequency.
frequency as you hear. And by doing just a multiplication by one, it is uh, T remains as it is. So what you hear the whole time in the background is the sound of natural numbers, we can say. By changing this factor here, you skip um, some values, but you remain. But um, the new sequence is also monotonous and has also these musical um, properties as the natural numbers have. Um, they also apply to the piano axiom. By adding different numbers to each line, you get a kind of canon. By using the modulo division, you can do a constraint to the pitches of a scale which appear. So it's um, only some simple rhythm remaining. To widen it again, you could apply here other modulo divisions. And of course, you can decide to do something more complex now. And by changing, for example, this factor in the base number, this additional factor in the base number, you get other scales. Okay, this was an example of live coding with AOG objectives. Since I met Damien Keller at CMMR 2019 in Marseille, I know that my concepts can make a good contribution to the ubiquitous music movement. The movement has set itself the goal of giving all people, especially laymen, the opportunity to compose or improvise music with the help of mobile devices and other computer platforms present on the Internet. And using their terminology, I see my work contributing to bringing forward the everyday creativity. On the other hand, AOG also reveals properties of natural numbers that are normally hidden. So AOG itself is also, and last but not least, a sonification method of number structures. Also in this direction, I am looking for new applications. For example, I had the idea that the projection of the points in the last diagram onto the logarithmic abscissa has a certain similarity to spectra and here perhaps an approach exists to make radio or light spectra audible and easily distinguishable. Finally, I am fundamentally interested in how a system should be designed and how users should know about it so that it appears simple and transparent to them. Here I really see two sides of the same coin. 
we need mental instruments to be able to grasp a certain thing and on the other hand an appropriate interface has to represent the object to be manu manipulated in a way that corresponds to these mental instruments. You can obtain further information at kraman.info slash 98 underline AOG. And maybe you can think of a possible application area and we can work something out together. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, and welcome to our presentation for the UBMoz Workshop 2020. My name is Joe Timoney, and I'm a researcher at Maynooth University in Ireland. This work has been done in collaboration with Zima Yassin and Damien McEvoy. I will give the first half of the presentation, and Zima will give the second half. The title of our presentation is The Potential Role of the Internet of Music Things in Therapeutic Applications. An outline of what we're going to talk about is the next slide, We'll speak about music and technology and the relationship between them and how technology has driven many new musical applications. We'll then talk about ubiquitous computing and its relationship with music. We'll move on then to the Internet of Things and followed by the Internet of Musical Things. Then we'll speak a little bit about the application area of therapy, music therapy and its relationship with music technology. After that, we'll introduce our proposed Internet of Musical Things framework and speak about how things interconnect within that. We'll also say a little bit on the assimilation of artificial intelligence to therapeutic applications and mention some recent work that's been done in the area. We'll give an example application. And then we'll end with some conclusions and some mention of future work. So technology has always had a profound impact on music. It influences how music is transmitted, preserved, heard, performed, and composed. The 20th century really has seen a huge intersection between technology and music. Look at how electronics has changed how we listen to, how we play, and how we perceive music. And then when computers came along at the end of the 20th century, it's changed completely how we interact with music. Now we have a situation where we have the ability to make very sophisticated music either by ourselves in group scenarios, using software on computers, and by sharing that or working over wired or wireless networks together. Ubiquitous computing means computing technology that exists everywhere. And there's been enormous developments in the field of smart devices over the last decades. Their prevalence in the form of smartphones these days, for example, means the world of computers everywhere is actually our current reality. So the area of ubiquitous computing draws together many different fields in computer science. And this is illustrated by the diagram in the following slide. And this was taken from a recent paper by two UBMOS researchers. They see how areas like networks, middleware, operating systems, microprocessors, UI, AI, all fit together to provide ubiquitous computing. The challenge really is how to merge these fields and create devices that behave in a ubiquitous manner for users that they can understand and work on. There are many challenges for ubiquitous computing. For example, how can we make user interfaces that work for users rather than for the tasks they're trying to do? How can we make sure that the connectivity is always effective? And how can we make devices that are context aware and adapt to make decisions as required? Also, there are issues that we must think about. But if devices are ubiquitous and they're connected, then how do we make sure our activities are private? So how is the monitoring monitored? 
ephemerality and transience. So how long does content last? Is everything we do recorded? Or is it of the moment, like many things we want to have? There's also the issue of control hierarchy between the user and the device. If the device is making effective decisions, that's great. But could the device take control away from the user entirely? At which point does the user determine that they're running the device? And then, of course, there's a behavioral impact of interaction model change. When we interact face to face, we behave in a certain way. When that moves into a wired wireless space across the network, do we change how we perceive things? Do we change how we talk to each other? So ubiquitous computing also has an influence on music. And it merges into many research fields in sound and music computing. And these go from music information retrieval, mobile computing, live coding, network music, music expression, digital audio effects, and languages for computer music. So UBMOS is a field in itself. Typical devices are cell phones, tablets, netbooks, microcontrollers, anything. Once you can program them and connect them, and they're independent, they're user-friendly, and can be expanded, added to. And of course, it's envisaged that the software is always open source and keeps to open standards. When it comes to the Internet of Things, in the broader sense, it's about everything being connected to the Internet. It involves networks, devices, and data. So all these devices are talking with each other on the network. Some are smart devices making intelligent decisions, and some are just relaying or sensing information. The whole idea is it leads to efficiencies in how things are done by information sharing and rapid data transfer. And from that, there should be economic gains in whichever field that they're applied. Now, when it comes to ubiquitous computing and IoT, the two terms are often taken to be equivalent, but it's not exactly the case. Ubiquitous computing actually predates IoT. It was conceived in the early 1990s. But IoT was first presented in 1998. So the critical literature sees IoT as a subset of ubiquitous computing, or as another facilitator, facilitator to greater ubiquity. One researcher from Australia actually presented a unifying framework between these that aims to distinguish a core and its properties. And this is just not for the technology profession. It's for the legal profession, the business community, and policymakers. And these are as much users as anyone else. Now, I'll pass you over to Azima. Thank you so much, Joe. Hello, this is Azima Yasin, and I'm a PhD student at Maynooth University. So let's talk about Internet of Musical Things. In 2018, Internet of Musical Things was first presented in a review paper. Here, things are musical things, and they are embedded with computing networks to produce or receive musical content. The musical things could be smart musical instruments or variables. The connectivity between them enable communication either at the same place or at different location. We can say Internet of Musical Thing is a subfield of IoT where its basic technological infrastructure enables ecosystem of interoperable devices, connecting musicians and audiences in novel ways. For example, the interaction between musicians, between audience and musicians, or between the audience. The research in ubiquitous music has already contributed to the advancement of Internet of Musical Things based creative proposals. The integration of multiple technological objects into ubiquitous ecosystems opens new opportunities for artistic applications of Internet of Musical Things and supports creative usage of Internet. The Memory Tree project is an example application which supports local and remote interaction. So it included the design of purpose-specific DIY hardware, employed a widely used mobile phone matching application, and piggybacked on the internet infrastructure. Now we will see then how music and technology together can support music therapy. Music therapy has both psychological and physical dimensions. As given in literature, there is a strong interest in the healing power of music. It has the potential to offer a drug-free or drug-reduced form of care. The technology and music therapy together can build a meaningful therapeutic process even when the client cannot express him or herself verbally. We propose a technology-led music therapy framework which employ IMSD. Client, therapist, and their musical interaction are three entities of the proposed framework. The client and therapist would be connected through smart musical instruments 
which connect two of them to perform a cooperative musical activity, for example, free improvisation. The data from various on-instrument sensors will then be used to monitor and analyze musical work of a client. This data could be used for embodied musical cognition and to assess their emotion associated with the music, which is music emotion recognition. The embodied musical prediction interface model given by the reference will track and analyzes a client's performance throughout the session. It will then try to recommend future musical activity that would be in line with the overall therapeutic goals. This figure is an abstract representation for the proposed framework. The client, therapist, and remote musical interaction are primitive entities of the model. The client and therapist participate in a cooperative music activity by using smart musical instruments. During a therapeutic session, the data about client can be collected in two manners. Data captured through on-instrument sensors and data about the music. The sensors could be biosensors or to collect data about client's physical actions or activity, which means corporeal interactions associated with the musical activity. The data from sensors will be processed for embodied music cognition and can be analyzed by the embodied musical prediction interface model which track body movements in the environment in which the musical activity is performed. The music performance provides data for music information retrieval to analyze the client's musical performance, for example, his idle and active states, associated emotions and behavior. Then all this information goes to the model which track and computationally analyze the session with respect to therapeutic goals and driven by the therapist. Here the study is needed for optimal machine learning techniques when the data is unsupervised and unstructured. The AI techniques are widely proposed by the researchers for this type of data, but a deep analysis is required. The session outcome and visualizations are customized to the client and his therapist and support the therapist to understand client when there is no verbal communication. The ubiquitous music creative practices can facilitate with how and what type of musical activities can be performed within a therapeutic session. Over the last five years, there has been a dramatic increase in the integration of AI and machine learning technologies. The major reason is deep learning. Awareness by the public in this technology has come from the media publicity for the applications such as Siri and AlphaGo. Its major strength is its ability for unsupervised learning with unstructured data. The deep learning was used by Music as Medicine Sync project. Another example includes predicting music therapeutic effectiveness using decision trees and random forest. The deep learning was used by Music as Medicine Sync project. Another example includes predicting music therapeutic effectiveness using decision trees and random forest. Also, the sound control project developed at Goldsmith University uses key nearest neighbors and neural networks in user interface design for children with disabilities. We present the technology mediated free improvisation as a sample application based on proposed framework. This therapy is carried out as a remote interaction using smart devices. The therapist directs patients to play music as a free improvisation without imposing any complex tools of sound, notes, sequencing, or music, and letting them engage through their own feelings and creativity. The IMST framework ensures the effectiveness of the communications on the infrastructure and the quality of the experience. The free improvisation offers therapeutic benefits, but for that, its overall effects on human health and well-being should be analyzed. Performance measurement requires a complex analysis of improvisational parameters. For example, amount of time spent in active or idle states, number of nodes used and pressed in a specific time, intensity of nodes, dynamics, and selected pitch classes. The given reference mentioned these parameters as a basic criteria to establish a tracking model for computational music therapy. So to conclude, in our presentation, we have considered the new developments in the Internet of Musical Things and how it relates to ubiquitous computing and music. 
Using the example of music therapy, a framework was presented illustrating the interaction between the client and therapist in a remote music interaction. Finally, the inclusion of AI technologies such as deep learning will drive the effectiveness of future applications. With respect to the future work, we can develop the framework to give it a more formal basis. It could be as a meta model defined using a modeling language. More research into the benefits that AI, not just the deep learning, can bring to the therapeutic applications should be carried out. We should develop a relationship with the clinical community to find a way to gather data and obtain feedback. This is the last but not the least. So this is all. Thank you so much for listening. Hello everyone, I'm very glad to be here, my name is Pedro, and today we'll be discussing Musical Smart City Perspectives on Ubiquitous Sonification. So, what in fact are we talking about here? Smart cities can be described as urban areas with sensor networks that collect data towards an efficient management of assets and resources. Within smart cities, data is ubiquitous and heterogeneous, and these might present opportunities to increase citizens' awareness of the environment and consequently their well-being. However, making sense of smart city data is challenging for a layperson, and in this process of interpreting smart city data, there is clearly a dominance of visual culture over oral culture. Moreover, there's a deficit regarding the use of the audio modality in this context. This introduction led us to frame the following research question. How can we use the audio modality, specifically music, to make sense of the Internet of Things data in the context of smart cities? In order to start thinking about this problem, a first step was to carry out a literature survey uh, focused on three major topics, sonification, smart cities, and ubiquitous music and mobile music. So what, in fact, are smart cities? Literature shows that there is no formal, unified definition of what constitutes a smart city. They do agree that smart cities share the paradigm of data available everywhere. A trivial smart city ecosystem may consist of sensors for infrastructures, mobility, environment, services and user devices, and these sensors are embedded in the civic environment or worn by the person. In this sense, both citizens and engineered sensors act as a source of data. Regarding ubiquitous music, as most of you are aware, it focuses on the music available everywhere paradigm. And, as described by Pimenta et al., in ubiquitous music, a device is an agent that adapts itself to the musical activity, to the local environment, and to other agents that interact with it. In mobile music, we often experience the use of mobile devices that act as interfaces towards music creation and listening. Its location-based nature is particularly important here. Often sound experiences that are normally driven by GPS, where users' movement in specific zones trigger playback of sound or music. Regarding sonification, it can be defined as the use of non-speech audio to convey information, the definition proposed by Gregory Kramer in the 90s. Some common techniques of sonification are audification, where there's a direct mapping of data points to sound pressure levels, parameter mapping sonification, which is the most common type of sonification, where data points are mapped to parameters of the sonification, such as pitch or tempo, for example, model-based sonification, where we use an acoustic model that generates an output when excited, and auditory icons, understood as oral metaphors in which the sound that is heard is a representation of an event. As for the main use tools, literature suggests SuperCollider, Pure Data, and Max MSP. A survey about interactive sonification publications in which a user can interactively manipulate the data's transformation into sound was also carried out. And finally, we also covered musification, which can be seen as a sonification technique that uses scales 
chords, key and table changes as proposed by Stephen Barras, or as an organized unification, which leverages Edgar Fares' definition of music as organized sound, this definition being proposed by Nuria Bonet. To illustrate the dichotomy between a purely informational sonification and one that is more concerned with the aesthetic merits of the composition, in this slide we have on the left one well-established example of sonification, the Geiger-Müller counter, here representing the focus on the conveyance of information. On the opposite right, we have a piece by Brazilian composer Heitor Villa Lobos from 1957, where the musician translates the New York City skyline into notes on the piano. This last example is clearly more concerned with the artistic aspect. Finally, in our vision of a musical smart city, if there would be a compromise between one or the other sides of this spectrum, we would opt for an emphasis on the aesthetics as depicted by the orange circle on the grid. To achieve a vision of a musical smart city, we propose a definition of ubiquitous sonification as a type of sonification that leverages ubiquitous computing environments, where a user is permanently immersed in a personal, unobtrusive digital space. We would also like to point out that ubiquitous sonification is different from ubiquitous music, for the first has a component of information conveyance and doesn't focus only on the musical value of the system. There are also synergies with interactive sonification due to the fact that the user is part of the digital space. Thus, our vision of a musical smart city is a location-based system that is able to increase inhabitants' urban awareness within a city, while at the same time accounting for an exploration of their environment in a musical way. To reach this vision, we start by dividing the space into two distinct components, environment-driven ubiquitous sonification, what we also call the outer space, and is related with data from inhabitants' surroundings, such as air pollution, crime rate, land usage, or traffic, and user-driven ubiquitous sonification, also called the inner space, more concerned with users' physiological, inertial, and location data provided by smart wearable devices and phones, things such as heart rate, hand gestures, head movement, and location. Here, we could use machine learning techniques for dimensionality redu reduction purposes, given, given the fact that datasets might be too big to handle, in order to extract higher level features from it. Or we could use machine learning and AI as compositional tools, implementing deep learning systems for music generation that account for some degree of control. Finally, this will result in the combination of both environment-driven and user-driven ubiquitous sonification, having a user interface to mediate interaction with listeners. For this, we aim to minimize the visual display, making the interface as unobtrusive as possible, trying to stir the users away from the screen. As for the challenges related with this vision, we enlist four major difficulties. Data gathering and characterization, related with Internet of Things, data streams and their nature, temporal and spatial scales, reflecting on their suitability for sonification. User requirement identification, taking into account what city aspects users would like to learn more about or experience in an enhanced way when using the auditory modality. Artificial intelligence for sonification and musification, where can we apply it? Dimensionality reduction, as stated before, cross-model mappings between different types of data, deep learning for music generation, and finally, design and evaluation of the system. How to investigate the system's ability to convey information about a given subject and also assess its creative and aesthetic merits. These are all key points to be kept in mind towards the deployment of a musical smart city. Some progress was done on the side, namely a prototype of a sonification of air pollution levels from one week of 2019 and one week of 2020, these values being measured at a station in Mile End Road, London. 
This was programmed using the Bella board designed for ultra low latency and high quality audio and the code was written in C++. For the sonification process, we use a musical borrowing procedure where a spectral delay effect is applied on the piece air on the G-string by Johann Sebastian Bach and is controlled by NO2 values. What you will hear is a snippet, for the sake of time, changing from a period in the week of 2019 to the same week of 2020. Higher values of air pollution increase the gain and feedback of the delay effect, and lower values render the audio closer to the original, hence less sonically polluted, if you will. All the code and material is available online. In conclusion, with this paper, we presented a literature survey on the topics of smart cities, ubiquitous music, mobile music, and sonification. We started a debate over the distinctions between musification and sonification, and we proposed a definition of ubiquitous sonification. Finally, we presented a vision towards a musical smart city system, discussing its challenges and future work. These are the references of this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Meu nome é Rom, eu sou mestrando em Ciência da Computação pela Universidade Federal de São João del Rei. E hoje eu vou falar sobre o uso cotidiano da internet das coisas musicais e suas interseções com a música ubíqua. Durante a apresentação, vou abordar esses tópicos, a começar por uma breve introdução sobre a internet das coisas musicais. Esse é um dos vários subcampos da internet das coisas e se relaciona a várias áreas de estudo, como o músico ubíquo, a interação humano-computador, novas interfaces para expressão musical e arte participativa. A comunicação pode se dar por meio de internet, redes locais e protocolos, aplicativos e serviços. Nós propomos a divisão da internet das coisas musicais em cinco partes, de acordo com alguns critérios que a gente vai ver agora. A começar pela comunicação. Para serviço de internet, como um todo, a arquitetura mais utilizada é o cliente-servidor, que é um modelo centrado justamente no servidor como principal provedor de recursos. No entanto, a comunicação na internet das coisas musicais pode escapar dessa arquitetura e usar um modelo de comunicação ponto a ponto, onde a presença de um nó central na rede não é necessária. Os fluxos de informação podem ser desde de dados de áudio em tempo real até dados de controle, como mídia SC ou até mesmo arquivos musicais. Outra parte importante nessa comunicação diz respeito aos dispositivos envolvidos nela. Só que, antes de mais nada, é importante entender o que são as coisas musicais. Uma coisa musical é, portanto, um objeto musical que deve ter conexão com a internet 
e capacidade de processar informações musicais. E um conceito que está por trás disso são, são coisas digitais. E é aqui que a gente propõe as coisas musicais virtuais, que utilizam serviços de software para coletar, analisar e transmitir informação com propósito musical. Já os papéis, eles podem ser definidos como um conjunto de ação, o um conjunto de ações, melhor dizendo, que um dispositivo apresenta em uma atividade musical. É, essa função tem um impacto direto no design do hardware e do software do dispositivo, uma vez que a funcionalidade e os componentes estão interrelacionados. Só que, sem a intervenção de um usuário, os objetos são incapazes de realizar algo, e pode ser essencial que haja ação humana para que eles funcionem. Então, o impacto exercido por usuários e músicos no manuseio das coisas reflete diretamente nos seus papéis. O ecossistema ele, ele é baseado na ideia de vários dispositivos interconectados e trabalhando em conjunto para criar um fluxo de informação. As vantagens de planejá-lo é que ele melhora a capacidade de conexão e o fluxo de trabalho de um grupo. E, finalmente, o público-alvo é, pode ser definido por Tuxê, ele é dividido em cinco partes. São músicos artistas, engenheiros de som, membros do público, estudantes de música e professores de música. Para os músicos e artistas, essas ferramentas elas são úteis permitindo o ensaio remoto, interação com dispositivos musicais, por meio de redes locais ou nuvem e instrumentos inteligentes. Para os engenheiros de som, surge a possibilidade de produções inteligentes, seja ela em estúdio, em apresentação ao vivo, além de suporte de instrumentos inteligentes. Para membros do público, eles aumentam experiências multissensoriais para maior participação no processo criativo. E para professores e alunos, permite um maior feedback e um monitoramento remoto das atividades. Quanto aos campos relacionados, é, vamos abordar especificamente dois deles, que é a música ubíqua e a arte interativa. Aqui eu vou falar de como que esses campos podem ajudar a internet das coisas musicais como serem ajudados. É, a música ubíqua, como outros domínios de pesquisa, propõe o seu próprio ecossistema. E esse ecossistema ele suporta a integração de áudio com ferramentas que permitem a interconexão de equipamentos e pessoas, além de suportar a interação de locais remotas e fornecer meios para distribuir a carga computacional entre as unidades, que é um conceito que pode ser abordado pelo, pela internet das coisas musicais. Outra contribuição que a UBI nos fornece diz respeito aos meios de implementação e acessibilidade, já que permite o desenvolvimento de novas tecnologias com redução de custo. A arte interativa ela é definida como espetáculos que permitem a participação da audiência mediada pela tecnologia. E aqui a internet das coisas musicais pode facilitar a criação musical e o envolvimento do público nesse tipo de peça. O IOMUST ainda expande as capacidades dos artistas, permite que pessoas com pouco conhecimento musical ou tecnológico participem do espetáculo. E dos exemplos, a gente cita o Caos da Cinco, que é uma performance interativa criada por pesquisadores da FCJ. O Swarmage, onde o público consegue tocar instrumentos musicais através do smartphone. E o Three Dreams, que a partir da análise de emoção de tweets, as pessoas geram som. Nessa imagem, a gente vê é, o público do Caos da 5 utilizando seus smartphones para interagirem com os artistas e com a peça como um todo. E nos desafios, a gente vai começar pelos tecnológicos. Eles estão sujeitos aos mesmos problemas que a tecnologia em geral sofre, em especial a internet das coisas. Mas o foco aqui vai ser aqueles inerentes à, à própria internet das coisas musicais. E a gente começa citando a latência e sincronização do som. É, como essa é uma área que pretende auxiliar em performances musicais, esses dois fatores representam um problema. Ainda mais são coisas da própria natureza do som e também da própria natureza da troca de informação via internet. Outro problema diz respeito à falta de interoperabilidade entre os dispositivos da rede e também falta de padronização. Isso porque em um ambiente distribuído não é possível ter informações prévias sobre quais dispositivos vão fazer parte desse ambiente. E, finalmente, tem um problema sobre o design do equipamento, né? que, novamente, citando a diversidade do ecossistema, tanto da internet das coisas musicais quanto da música ubíqua, a aplicação de música ela, ela se dá por, por objetos que não são tradicionais 
que não são feitos para isso, né? como, por exemplo, o smartphone. Então, deve-se levar em consideração o consumo de energia, a necessidade de suportar a comunicação entre usuários e ter baixa latência, processamento de som e comunicação. No que diz respeito aos atos artísticos, os dispositivos eles não devem ser um empecilho. É, os segundos coisas, eles devem ter a sua performance ajudada por eles e não prejudicada, além de dos dispositivos conterem recursos para lidar com latência e eventuais perdas de conexão. Ainda nesse sentido, as ferramentas devem ser fáceis de aprender, intuitivas de utilizar, e a tecnologia pode impactar negativamente o setor criativo, substituindo funções humanas por aquelas soluções baseadas em máquinas. Por último, a gente cita problemas de direitos autorais. É, já que isso vai auxiliar criações colaborativas que emergem é, dessas estruturas, tem problemas que podem dizer quem que é o proprietário da obra e se uma gravação seria legalmente viável. Quanto aos problemas sociais, a gente cita abundância de tecnologia pode gerar é, escassez por uma outra parte da sociedade, o estabelecimento de padrões e demandas da classe dominante nem sempre está em, em acordo com o do próprio indivíduo que quer utilizar é, dessa tecnologia, o acesso não heterogêneo às tecnologias é, são mais visíveis em áreas intensamente povoadas, tem um acesso mais fácil às novidades, e isso também se relaciona com a falta de estrutura, né, que é mais precária em áreas rurais e em áreas periféricas. E, finalmente, a gente cita o consumo excessivo, que pode gerar um apartheid social. Dos, os problemas ambientais são bem conhecidos também, e eles vão desde produção e descarte de resíduos, consumo de recursos não renováveis, até estúrbios ecológicos e risco, riscos para a saúde. Dos problemas econômicos, a gente tem aqueles já citados anteriormente, né, que é substituir a mão de obra humana por soluções de máquina. Bom, o, o nosso artigo ele apresentou uma visão geral do IOMST, a fim de aproximar essa área da comunidade brasileira de uma forma geral. A gente também propõe uma aproximação entre a ciência da computação e a arte, e as principais contribuições desse trabalho para o campo da internet das coisas musicais está na divisão do, desse campo, de acordo com comunicação, dispositivo, papel, ecossistema e público-alvo, além da gente apresentar as coisas musicais virtuais. E ainda a gente trouxe os problemas enfrentados por países de capitalismo periférico ao lidar com a inserção de uma nova tecnologia. A gente agradece a todos os membros do Alice, assim como as agências de financiamento CNPq, FAPEMIG e CAPES. Qualquer dúvida, estamos à disposição. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Hello. Hello. Now we are back for the session with the authors. Uh, before we start the questions from the audience, we they ask if any one of you want to talk something, want to give like a, a bit of explanation or introduction. I know Guido want to show something. Um, not in the moment, but okay, or um, maybe okay. Um, then on your I, I, I could, there, there was a little um, um, bug in, in my um, presentation. Uh, do you see my screen now and hear me? Yes, but on YouTube was all right, it was just between us. The Sorry? Bad sound. The bad sound was just between us on YouTube was all right. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's working with my um, video inside the desktop. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. And um, I could show something which is um, a special um, central thought in my work. Um, that um, there is no free lunch, there is no um, 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 by learning something or uh, um, by understanding something, um, it's always much work. 
But um, the main thought in my work is that f some lunches we've paid already. Um, we spent 10 years and more in school to learn arithmetics. This was not easy, but now it's easy to us to do arithmetics. And um, this is much more common to mo more people than learning harmonics, counterpoint, and so on. And that is the basic thought why I'm using arithmetic operations or why it is um, easy to work with this to compose. Was it now um, streamed, what I was saying? <laughs> yes, yeah, it was all right. Okay. Um, so, I, okay. Uh, I saw one question upcoming, I have to um, uh, say. <laughs> um, I could, um, um, it was about which scales can be obtained. Should I answer to it? Yes. Yeah, It would well, be nice to explain how to obtain a scale. Okay. As I saw it coming up, um, I made up here <laughs> a little um, paper. Um, okay. Um, as I explained in the video, um, the basic thing where the frequencies are made up is the so-called base number, which is designed from potencies of small prime numbers. And uh, by taking away some of these potencies, maybe take here um, one of these three, um, remaining two, um, by dividing um, rule numbers, um, you get um, rule numbers as frequencies. And um, by doing so, you obtain something like a pentatonic scale, but you can also increase these potencies and you get something more complex. And furthermore, by um, um, stretching or making smaller this um, base number with, a, um, with the additional factor, let's say uh, 0.1, you come into microtonal scales also. So the point is not which scale can be obtained at all with the method, it's which relationship um, is um, obtained in between the um, um, evolving uh, frequencies, which can be obtained uh, by this. And um, okay, and now I'm coming to the um, a little mistake in my presentation by shortening it, um, the explanation why it works was removed. <laughs> so I could tell two words about it when it is okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, if you look to the natural numbers, you find the inner structure, the dividers, the prime factors inside. And um, if you compare, let's say, two and three, it's like a fifth from a musical standpoint. And uh, if you look to them like there were intervals, you um, realize that numbers which are um, uh, which which have a more dissonant relationship to their neighbors appear rarely. And the more consonant they are concerning to their neighbors, they appear more often. And this is um, shown in this diagram. If you have an, um, a more um, dison uh, consonant neighborship, you find the next one which has the same consonant way uh, is close. And uh, close to this um, number in average, And the more dissonant to the neighbors a number is, you find another one far away which for which the same is the case. Um, but to um, have it in this way, to, it's a special point of view to the natural numbers, uh, which again is made up by using these base numbers, which filter only small prime factors out of the natural numbers. Okay, for further um, 
um, understanding, um, you could go to my um, website I told in the video about also. And um, <clears throat> okay, are there other questions? Sorry, this was the wrong thing. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, there are a couple of questions for all the authors, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah. Guys, even authors here, if you have any questions uh, so I, on, from one another, you can write down here in the chat on the Google Meet, or you can write down on uh, YouTube as you prefer. Okay, Pedro. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, Guido, for you, let's start with you then. Uh, there is a question from Thiago Marcondes. Uh, he's asking you if the sounds, uh, they are uh, samples or they are synthesized? Um, the sounds, okay, um, it's it's not so much about the sounds, what, what I'm doing, but actually I'm using uh, physical modeling um, tools to obtain um, um, natural sounds from natural instruments. And um, yeah, and, and controlling it by by MIDI. In the um, but on the web um, oriented devices, of course, I'm using samples because there's an opportunity to use um, um, other things are not given at the moment. Okay, uh, I think I I believe Ariane, it will be best if we share uh, this time among all the authors. So we're going to ask one for okay. author. And then you come back, okay? Um, so if there are any other authors that would like to say something before I start the questions? You should uh, stop your presentation now, Guido, please. Yes, so yes. You can see okay. other people's screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, okay. so the second one was Pedro. Do you want to talk something about your work? Or maybe Macho? Uh, I, I think we are... Uh, no, the, second one, the second one actually was... Uh, yes. Azima, yes. Azima, can you do you want to talk something uh, before we start questioning? Um, no, I think it's kind of fine. The same, we can start with the questions from home. Joseph is here. Maybe he want to talk. I don't think so. So he's not here. He just wait, just entered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, so, Joseph. Joe. Okay, so if you don't want to say anything, especially maybe we can. Pedro, do you want to say something? Uh, no, I was just saying that we were ready for the questions. Okay, and then uh, Ove and Damien, if you want to say something, or Homolo? Uh, I'm fine. Okay, so we can go ahead with the questions. All right then. Yeah. Uh, uh, Damian Keller, someone you may know, uh, is asking Joe and Azina, uh, the discourse around IOMST seems to be too optimistic. For instance, how would you handle this issue with a therapeutic context? How is the monitoring or monitored? Uh, okay, so... So um, I would say uh, the kind of idea was when we have uh, a framework like IOMST, um, it's, it's actually a technological framework which could make it possible to 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 transfer the sound to uh, over the internet and to receive the sound as well and let the musicians or the audience to to be the to be to participate in a musical activity which is being held remotely. And then we have UBMS practices uh, which uh, we can think of like just. To, to mention an example, we can think of musical activities to perform the person's overall performance and daily activities in, in a book, Ubiquitous Music. Uh, there is an example of students who are performing musical activities together. Uh, it could help them to make them more resilient in daily life or their, their school uh, educational life. So that means there is a possibility to use this kind of uh, uh, practices for uh, for the persons to make their their health better to to make their uh, daily life a bit um, you know uh, kind of could say not um, with respect to very specific to the health but maybe the well being would be the more proper word for this. So when we have a technological framework to connect two persons to to perform musical activity and we have practices 
<clears throat> which uh, which are proposed to to make a human health better with with help of a musical devices or activities then yeah we can say there is a possibility to use these kind of frameworks for therapeutic applications and the therapy actually is it's itself a very broader term we cannot say what kind of therapy because the therapist would be better answer that uh, but yeah we can say we can, we can set up an environment for a musical activity and as far as we talk about the monitoring part so i would say uh every talking about the devices are smart they have sensors to receive or send the sound uh, and to analyze the data as well so we can use the data to uh, you know there are fields musical fields like music emotion recognition and uh, you know again how we can uh, perceive the person's emotion with the help of music he's playing or he's engaging with uh, so we can use that kind of data or other things could be there are some gestures recognition devices for example the time flight or we can talk about the studio cameras which could be used to you know to uh, to see a person how he is performing how active he is during his activity so we cannot say too much to sure about this because this is kind of an idea and uh, because we just saw some examples um on the internet and then the literature as well where therapist music therapist has proposed that there is a way to to uh, give the therapy on the phone or using telehealth networks so when we can do we can use phone or telehealth networks for this then with the help of monitoring uh, sensors and technology we can think of uh, having a bit of uh, monitoring of a patient or client when the therapist is not close to the person so yeah thank you azena uh pedro uh how would you characterize a not smart city musification uh thanks for the question that's actually a, a very interesting question to me because the word smart as the word intelligence in artificial intelligence are kind of buzzwords these days that i don't really agree to so i don't think that a smart city is smarter than a not smart city per se what i what we were trying to mean here at, at, is that these smart cities will have um, well smart devices or at least data collecting or data gathering devices that after human um uh, of the humans have worked over that data will hopefully generate something that we could considering to be a, a, a smart system but following the idea of a not smart city so something that doesn't have uh, a a a thorough or a deep uh, system of wireless sensors uh, for a myriad of of sectors my first thought of a musification of something like that would be to to point to works uh, by Moray Sheffer for example the world soundscape project so what what comes to my mind when we talk about that is something completely different from what we were proposing here uh i don't know if matia has anything else to add perhaps the example you gave in your talk about villas lobos if i'm pronouncing his name well the brazilian composer would be a good example of a uh, composer's work working with data in a, at the abstract level like the the uh skyscrapers landscape in new york and creating a, a whole composition about that and um it's a very different approach but the the music somehow is inspired by um data as well so that that would be an example i guess of uh, of a, a musification done fully by a human taking a creative approach to being inspired by by some kind of data i guess all right thank you pedro thank you matia homolo for you now how do you propose to deal with massive deployment of sound bamasque spaces something that is implicit in the io music uh, so our work focuses on emerging countries and people who do not necessarily have easy access to technology so i think the solutions go through the popularization of technological and digital means such as smartphones and even internet access uh, for that we must use open source equipment in addition to the creation of new interface for and production music there was a question uh, to guido from pedro here 
Do you want to uh, ask yourself? Yes, yes, yes. It's not Do you want to ask yet. yourself, Pedro? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So this is, thanks for the presentation first, Guido. Uh, this is a more uh, philosophical or debatable question, but do you think that uh, in music, everything can be formalized uh, through a mathematical model, or do you think there are aspects of music that are simply unattainable to, to mathematics? Thanks. So, oh, um, okay. Um, hmm, um, uh, an amazing uh, and a, um, interesting question, of course, and um, you may think I'm always doing everything in this way I'm doing here. Um, actually, um, I um, I do not think that everything can be formalized in music. Of course not. Um, but um, I'm searching. But of course, um, we are. Um, always working with symbols to describe what we mean. And um, and uh, the symbols is not the same as a phenomenon of music, of course. Um, for one person, um, this um, score is cryptic and you may be used to it and it's uh, you, you see it like you would um, hear music if you are a good musician and you are used to this um, type of uh, description. My type of description is a very different one. Uh, one has to learn, of course, uh, as everything of uh, symbolic representation should uh, to be learned, but it's not the same as the music. The phenomenon music is uh, something uh, very different. Um, but for composing, it's a meta level you can, can go to and you can really um, do amazing things like um, repetitive phrases in infinite, um, which you have to write down in the score um, in a very uh, annoying way. And, um, and uh, it is easier to learn for um, normal um, people who pass the school than um, writing down a score on a white paper. And um, in the sense of uh, Chomsky's um, um, generative um, uh, grammar classes, um, my one is one of grade three, which means um, it produces um, in a way well-formed structures um, as it deals with something which has something musical inside itself. It's uh, nature numbers represented here by T in this formula. And so um, it gives some, some support for people, but is of course not the same as music. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, now <laughs> I, I'm waiting for the reply to my uh, talk, but there will come no one, um, uh, maybe <laughs> someone who can talk, can uh, say something. There is, there is actually a couple of more questions regarding the same topic, Guido. Uh, okay. Uh, Eric Lima, one of the guys who's following you on YouTube, uh, he's saying that uh, your work is very, very cool. And he... He's asking if there is uh, a way or a plan for doing this in a more friendly interface or allow people <laughs> who are so specialized or familiar with algorithm making uh, to use them as a main compositional tool. Uh, along, yes. the, uh, along the same lines, there are other uh, questions here that I'd like to merge as one uh, topic so you can talk about it. Uh, is that if you consider uh, the way you actually structure uh, this this tool uh, as the mm -hmm. normal way uh, who actually people think music. If it is something, uh, do you do you think music is something more organic or more rational uh, in a way of uh, cognitive traits used in music making and well musical activities in general? Mm -hmm. Okay, these are a couple of questions, but they are all um, circling around some um, special thing. I, I guess I understand it. Um, okay. Um, okay, as I said before, 
it is a kind of symbolic system what I'm making up here, and um, it's a um, and uh, of course it is different to um, what is music um, as phenomenon, um, and um, but it it is a um, a very um, compact way to represent musical structures. Um, so um, you can think about. Um, uh, but you can think about, of course, user interfaces, which um, which make use of these um, formulas. And of course, I, I tried out, out several um, to make it more um, uh, nice to handle these, these formulas. Um, but at the end, this representation um, as formula has also some um, advantages. You can um, um, you can uh, estimate how a special structure in formulas will sound if you have some experience with it, and you one um, short look to the formula will give you an impression of it if you um, experimented a bit around with it. Um, but of course, there are several ways to. Um, to work with it, and um, so I made up um, the last uh, time an interface using um, a vibraphone, an ele electronic one with MIDI interface, and um, by and it's working in the following way. Um, first, I make up a basic structure of my formulas, where I. Um, uh, we are here in real time how it sounds like um, to, to obtain a special musical direction I would like to go to. But then in the second step, I um, decide which parts of my formula are freed to be optimized by an algorithm. And this algorithm will do the fo uh, following. When I'm playing, a timestamp and my pitch is saved, and the algorithm, the optimization algorithm, tries to um, to change the formula where I give the um, a, a low to it um, in a way that my that the formulas would have played the same notes with this timestamp in the past. And this um, and the, the um, result is that there is a special coherence in between what I'm playing and what the algorithm is doing in the present by this um, opti kind of optimization. And so um, I have a very um, a kind interface which is um, yeah close to uh, making music with a partner. And um, so it's, um, but at the same time, still the formulas are visible and can be um, um, grasped in, in one um, view um, concerning its, its structure. And um, so um, a musician can combine both, can make up a general basic structure of these formulas and then uh, begin to play and um, having something which is accompanying one in a special way um, uh, he want he wanted to. Okay, uh, guys, I, I'm kind of juggling here. Uh, questions coming from this, uh, uh, the different sources. Your, so, you stop uh, your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. You. All right. So I'm kind of juggling here uh, questions that are coming from different sources, YouTube, Facebook, and here in Google Meet as well. So I will just ask you to, to actually complement a question that Matthew uh, asked here in Google Meet. It's not visible to everyone, so I'm going to read it. Uh, he, Matthew's asking, but what about the higher level of control, for example, a knob uh, that a musician used to, to control without necessarily understanding the maths behind it, even though uh, the, uh, now the maths are beautiful there. Uh, oh, okay, it's again for me. <laughs> yeah, that's good, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, okay, I will do it with the camera this time, maybe. Um, uh, yes, 
um, okay, for 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 one who starts dealing with it, um, I, I made up, up these um, these interfaces. Another one is for children where they can um, um, decorate um, with colored um, things balls, and it is transformed into these formulas in a special way. Um, so there are ways to um, uh, to hide away uh, the formulas. On the other hand, um, these formulas hmm, um, yeah, <sighs> represent really something um, musical. You you can have in a very compact way a musical structure. And okay, you have to learn in any time. <clears throat> whatever you do and which approach ever you um, decide to use, you have to learn something. <laughs> and um, and um, if you are not an, a victim of some um, performance where you just are a small um, wheel, um, like a random generator inside something, um, you, you should be involved in what is behind the things. I'm trying to make something which is in a way flat, which is not too complicated, which is um, which can be uh, presented uh, sh in a sh uh, um, shortly. Um, but um, many other approaches are like that they hide completely the complexity behind what is done, and you have no, um, you are not involved in the process in an um, understanding way. Uh, this is typical for many things where you can just dip in and what after this dipping in, what what if you want to make more? Then again, you are set, okay, go to um, music school and learn for 10 years um, harmony and counterpoint. And um, this is the way what is coming after doing some... Um, um, yeah, some nice performance by handling some... Um, uh, some knobs and some gestures. Um, you you never will learn what is behind it. You because the whole thing is not um, um, built up for this purpose. Yes. So okay. Thank you, Guido. Uh, next yeah. one for Azima, Damien, and Joe. IOT. Oh, sorry. Uh, IOT is a subset of Ubicont. He's stating that. Uh, so and he's asking then. So that means that IOMUSTI is a subset of UBMUS. Uh, how do you see musical knowledge contributing to the therapeutic goals? Two questions. Uh, <laughs> who wants to say that? Damien, do you want yeah, to try that? I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. I think in the context that we were talking about, it's uh, musical therapy. So as Azim was saying earlier on um, in the question, Sometimes we're we're more concerned in musical therapy about the well-being of the individual. And for people, let's say, for example, they're at end of life, terminal illness, some sort of um, activity, any activity at all, can be used to reduce anxiety and, and panic and those emotions associated with that stage. Musicality would probably come from the therapist and they could guide a patient through the canon of music, um, allow them to express their emotions. So I would say that musical knowledge is uh, probably central to using this, especially if we were talking about a networked performance where um, a call response thing could be done. So, you know, you could set up, uh, if we talk about pulse-based music and you, you set up a BPM, a key signature, you could add form and structure to a performance and then allow the client to break away from that to express themselves further. It would give a sense of purpose and um, musical knowledge. So maybe the client themselves is, an, is a quote unquote non-musician when they first encounter this um, therapy. But from there, the musicality could lead to an interest, lead to a purpose, a drive. Uh, so I would say that musical knowledge would be um, helpful and probably central from the therapist's point of view. Okay, thanks, Damien. Uh, any of, any uh, of the other authors would like to complement that? 
Um, I suppose I could I agree with Damien. I think uh, it was therapy too. The more musical knowledge you have, the maybe easier it is to get involved or engage with the therapeutic process because uh, it gives you just more options. And maybe you can help to give more feedback to the therapist. Um, a colleague of mine has done a lot of stuff with enabling musicians, so people who would have a physical disability, um, but they would have been musicians and maybe they've lost arm or they've lost some digits on their hand. And they they express this frustration of like, don't approach me like I have a mental disability. Don't approach me like I'm limited in my faculties. I'm limited in my knowledge. I'm limited in, in my physicality. So yeah, I think musical knowledge would, as Joe said, people who are already interested in that would take that route in their therapy. Okay. And what about the second part of the question? Would you consider the IOMUSTI as a subset of uh, Udemus? Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Nobody's jumping in. Uh, IOMUS is a subset of Udemus. Uh, yes. I think we, in the preparation of the, the presentation, uh, we did begin to feel that is the case. UBMOS is an overarching concept, and IOMOST is only a, a, an aspect of that. And it's it's an aspect that's probably going to develop in the future. It's not it's certainly not there yet. We're only beginning to define IOMOST and the frameworks that go with it. But uh, it could well be an important point in the sense that if the internet uh, is as ubiquitous and IOMOST becomes uh, as ubiquitous as that, well, then it certainly fits into the whole concept. It fits into it conceptually anyway. Okay, regard to that then, uh, it's something that, well, uh, to all the, the, the authors that actually talked about uh, IOMST, uh, would you consider uh, that it is useful to think IOMST as opposed to Ubimus? Well, I could say that with the other authors, we're looking at, you know, sonification in cities, the smart cities. So I guess it is part of a bigger picture. I almost see as part of music everywhere. Is that a fair point to say? I guess so, Joe. Uh, anyone else would like to comment on that? Or should we move to the next question? All right, to Pedro then. Uh, Pedro, why, Pedro and the other authors, of course. Why do you think ubiquitous sonification is different from Ubimus? Uh, what examples can you provide of ubiqu uh, ubiquitous sonification that do not involve aesthetics or that are not based on Ubimus uh, ecosystem? Uh, thanks. That's, uh, those are two very good and very interesting questions. Uh, trying to explain that. So, why do we think ubiquitous sonification is different from ubimus or ubiquitous music? Well, it kind of boils down, in our opinion, to the distinctions between sonification and musification. And in our vision, ubiquitous sonification is also inspired by sonification. So, having a, a, a musical outcome that resembles uh, for instance, the Geiger counter that I played or some simple side waves that are mapped to pitches could be a possible uh, solution for a ubiquitous sonification example. Uh, and that's what we mean in terms of poor aesthetics. Of, of course, this is all debatable, and uh, but that was what we were thinking on the first place. And uh, uh, we know that uh, the musical value, as as we stated, is not uh, it's 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 not important. It's not the target in ubiquitous music, as as I had on the slides. But what we meant is that it, it, we think it's important precisely to facilitate and to engage and to deepen this interaction between agents in an ecosystem. So that's why the, the musical value aspect is important in UV moves. And uh, although it is also important in, in ubiquitous sonification, there's also this component of information from from a more mathematical perspective, if you will, it's it's important to not only have music and interaction among agents, but this flow of information. Um, that's it. Can I ask you just a question there? Um, you, you know, with the Geiger counter, uh, yes. that, that has a sonification in itself, you know, that kind of buzzing noise it, it generates. 
So is the sonification you're doing, is it making it a kind of sweeter sound or is it? In, 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 in which kind of... Oh, the Geiger a, counter. When you use the example of the Geiger counter. Yeah, it, it's just a standard Geiger counter. So it's, it's a notification process. Mm. Um, and there's not really any, any, any specific process going on there. Mm. So it's just no. mapping uh, radioactive decay to, to some sort of transducer there. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. Thanks. Right, uh, Matthew, you, you, you wrote something here in the chat. Uh, your, our chat here in Google Meet is not actually visible to people on, on YouTube. So I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. Uh, it was just a comment for Damien and Joseph and Azima about their, their work. I uh, just wanted to mention the OMI Trust, which is an interesting body here in UK doing uh, some instruments for disabled people. And um, I don't know, but may maybe you could be interested to contact them to see for, for your project around music therapy. They might be interested as well. That's just a comment more than a question. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, Matthew, will you send us the detail of that? Can you email yes. it to one of us? Of course. In it's fact, this in the link. Uh, in the chat. I have yeah. the link in the chat. But I oh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, if you want, uh, I could also send you by by email if I have your email. If I get your email. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I um. Uh, I I put my email in the chat. <laughs> okay, Homo. The next one is for you. Uh, the previous question, just uh, just to, to refresh people's mind here, uh, they may ask you how do you propose to deal with the massive deployment of sound in a domestic space. Implicit to the IOMST. Uh, he, he believes that he does not understand quite well his question. So uh, he's pointing out that the problem is the overcrowding of the domestic space with sound, uh, as it occurs with cell phones, mic microwave ovens, alarms, and all the other sound sources. Uh, would you like to, to, to answer again this question? Uh, that, that's a problem of this kind of whole format, guys. It's no back and forth. We need to uh, answer, and then I need to collect the impressions and then write back. So sorry about that. Hey, Lens, se não for muito incômodo, você pode traduzir essa essa pergunta para mim, porque eu acho que eu realmente não entendi ela originalmente. Ele está perguntando assim, da so, sorry, guys, I want to speak a little bit about, uh, in Portuguese here now, just to translate to to Romulo here. Uh, ele está perguntando assim, como é que você é, propõe lidar com essa quantidade de sons que todos esses aparelhos é, trazem para dentro da nossa casa. né? Então, do, do barulho do micro-ondas, do, do telefone celular, das assistentes pessoais, esse tipo de coisa. É, eu posso responder em português, você faz a ponte de novo, se não for incômodo? Bem, vamos lá. Uh, 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 Romulo will, uh, will answer em português and then I will translate back to English, okay? I could yeah. add something if I am allowed. Um, I had a similar idea about um, on this problem. Um, um, you need a closed room for sound and cities are open. And um, this is um, a special yeah, feature of, of sound. Everything which is, has to do with music. If, you have to close. You have to wear, for example, um, headphones to um, to close up from the environment. So you can only be aware of one source at the same time. Or um, and if it's if it's a distinct one, which has to give you some information, and not an ambient one, which can also deal with mixed things, uh, which can uh, which which work also if they are. Um, um, crowded. Okay, okay, just as an addition. Right. Thank you, Guido. I'll pass on the, the, the door to Romulo again. Uh, o que o Guido disse, Romulo, é que uh, é diferente você ouvir na cidade onde está tudo aberto, diferente, uh, e ouvir dentro da sua casa. Na, na cidade você usa os headphones e tal, mas dentro da sua casa, onde está tudo aberto, talvez a diferença passe por aí. Então, vá lá, é. vá lá, respondeu. É porque eu acho que a gente não pensou nesse problema especificamente dele é, 
um aparelho interferir em outro, só que eu acho que isso entra na categorização que a gente fez, que a gente dividiu o IOMST em cinco partes, né? E uma delas dizia respeito ao ecossistema. Então, talvez nesse caso, é, seja o fato de pensar eles como ecossistemas separados, sabe? Onde um não tem relação com o outro, então, portanto, um não vai interferir no outro também. E o, o mesmo eu acho que vale para a pergunta do Guido, né? Porque aí não vai ter interferência nem nada do tipo. Ok, so basically what Romulo answer is that, well, uh, they didn't think about this issue in specifically, but they actually uh, use five different uh, categories, and one of them is the ubiquitous ecosystem. So they believe they belong, if they belong to different ecosystems, then uh, they, they somehow have approached this issue. So maybe to add just something on the comment from Damien here. Um, yeah, go ahead, When I read massive deployment of sound in domestic spaces, I can think about two things we commonly have in, in our houses, um, talking about the home, right? The TV and hi-fi system, uh, these, these are two things that um, predate ubiquitous computing and, and the Internet of Musical Things, and which bring sounds in the home. But nowadays with smart TVs, for instance, there is something interesting is that the TV is capable of listening to the sound in, um, in our space. So that brings me to think about data privacy. And um, um, you know, nowadays, if you don't turn off the option on your smart TV, you might have your smart TV listening to what's happening in your home sound-wise. And I think that's um, for ubiquitous music, internet of musical things, context, that's something that is important when we talk about scalability and massive deployment of these technologies in people's personal space. We also need to talk about data privacy and security and, and all that. So it's just something that the comment triggered um, a thought about that. I don't know if it's exactly what Damien had in mind, but I just wanted to add that to what Romilo said. Uh, I could maybe yeah. also add, add, add about um, the, the overcrowding of the sonic spectrum because this is something we we thought about in in our possible solution. Uh, we, we can we can we can maybe think about that music is already ubiquitous, uh, and uh, but the problem is that it should be synchronized and harmonized uh, and perceptually coupled in order to support our our activities and uh, and, and to be relevant. And we can maybe envision a system where all these devices are connected, and instead of being um, alarms, they are musical, and uh, and this is this is what we're ultimately hoping to achieve. Yeah. So I think Ove uh, was not introduced. Um, uh, is is uh, the founder of Holonix Systems, and um, it's a company that we work with together with uh, Pedro in the musical smart city. Uh, project and all Nix systems uh, has been releasing some apps that people can use on iOS devices to uh, create ubiquitous soundscapes or, or, or music generated by their interaction with the environment. All right, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Obi. Uh, Damien, it's agree here that uh, what you said is really an issue that should be addressed. Uh, Guido. Uh, another another question for you from YouTube: uh, Is the timing repeat feedback randomized, or does it read the perform the performer's tempo so as to play along? Um, okay, could you repeat the question? Sorry, I, I wrote down the question in the chat, but basically uh, he's asking if the if the timing. Uh, is randomized, or does it read the performance tempo as uh, so as to play along? Mm, okay, um, okay. There is um, nothing randomized, um, as in my method, rhythm and pitch um, comes out as one structure at the same time. Um, if you think of um, counting. Um, and um, which is um, the basic process um, for, for the sound generation in my method. 
um, then you just do a kind of filtering out from a continuing counting. Now the, think of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you take out um, uh, uh, <clears throat> every um, uh, number which has prime factors two, three, five inside and um, uh, make it sound, then you realize that there are many in between which are prime factors which have not these factors inside. So uh, by this process, um, at the same time, a rhythm appears and a harmonic relationship of the filtered elements um, which come to be um, frequencies and our plate um, evolves at the same time. Um, so um, there is um, nothing done with, with random in, in this um, process. Uh, or do you mean um, the change in the formula it itself when it was um, uh, reacting on my playing? Um, this is done by an optimization process. And of course, um, there are many possible solutions to come close to the um, pitch with the timestamp. Um, and um, there you can say, OK, this um, part um, can be seen as a type of random process, but it's not um, not inside the musical structure. It is in the selection of the musical structure, which is actually the one which is present. Does this answer the question? <laughs> or do you want to add something? Uh, he, he just needs a clarification here. He's saying that's interesting. Uh, and just confirming, so filtering and response uh, to the performance, is, is that correct, Chuck? So a filtering is the response to a performance, is that what you mean? Oh, well, why, why, why we wait him to clarify that? At the end, you have a question, right? Yes, um, I'm, I'm gonna ask both Guido and Pedro, the, like doing some kind of automatic music. Uh, generative or something. How do you imagine this type of music being co actually consumed by people? How people will listen to that? Uh, how do you imagine people listen to that? Like as closed pieces, as, as applications or... Gen so, yes, that's my question. Uh, I can start if Guido doesn't mind because he answered the last one. It was too brief. Uh, in our case, we envision the last stage of of our project as a mobile application. So a user could uh, perceive and increase his or her awareness of the city uh, while walking or while moving through the cities. Things like air pollution, where you are, for example, the number of um, inhabitants you have around you, others, other, other types of data from other sectors, for instance, crime rates in the region you are, and even interact uh, by having something that, he, that communicates uh, with the system via some smart devices. Once again, the word smart by devices that you have with you. So perhaps improvising over a soundscape that is mapped to air pollution and you improvise on that soundscape with things that you are doing with your hands, with how fast you're moving, with the movements you have on your hand. Well, it depends, of course, on the sensors, but to, to finalize, yes, a musical application, mobile music application. Okay. Um, okay, I can. Okay, I can only talk for me, <laughs> and um, 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 I, I made up also applications where um, uh, people can collaborate by using mobile devices. And they were able to um, type in formulas and at the same time seeing what the others are typing. And the effect was that um, people um, try to um, um, adapt to the others if it's sounding nice, what the others are doing in their opinion. And um, thus a special structure evolves, uh, which is represented in the symbol language at the same time and performing like a live performance in real time. 
Um, so, um, again, the compactness of this um, formular expression um, allows some things uh, which is not possible with a score or with a complicated, um, 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 let's say, pure data application or something. Um, and so um, you can grasp by one one view um, a structure of, of a whole um, complete uh, musical piece and adapt it to your purposes. You can send someone an email with three formulas and, hey, try this out, and um, um, he can make it um, hearable um, immediately or have experience and um, uh, grasp what, what is meant by, by this, for example. Okay, this is... Uh, two things I imagine, I, I think, like, for me, it was a bit suggestion that Maybe you could do something, Pedro, like for Pedro, like with the sounds people are already listening to, like on Spotify or something. I don't know. Because like, I really can't imagine like I am walking around and I'm going to change for an application that's just giving me information instead of just hearing music that I, I, I would like to hear. And for Guido, I, I was like thinking that that could be really nice maybe in video games or stuff like when you go around and create soundscapes with this formula that would be also interesting mm -hmm. applicate this okay. kind of mm -hmm. Yes, but now I pass for Leandro. Okay, so we're approaching the end of the session. Uh, last question to Romulo then. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, in English then Portuguese, okay, uh, Romulo. Uh, how do you propose to deal with the power asymmetries and the problems that you point out in your talk? Então, a pergunta é, Romulo, como que você propõe lidar com asimetrias de poder e os problemas que você apontou na sua fala? Eu estava falando mutado aqui. É, na verdade, eu citei alguns problemas, né, que vão desde questões ambientais até questões sociais, técnicas e artísticas, né. É, a começar pela parte artística, que eu acho que é a mais interessante aqui para nós, é, os dispositivos, eles não podem ser um problema para pro, os músicos ou quem estiver utilizando eles, né. Então, eles têm que ser ergonômicos, é, acho que seria interessante um sistema de backup, caso tenha queda na luz ou na conexão do aparelho. É, da parte econômica, a gente trata no nosso artigo sobre economia solidária, que é uma pessoa é, ajudando a outra sem o um interesse econômico por trás ou sem uma questão de hierarquia que possa cobrar em cima dessa. É, a questão social, a gente volta para a questão do open source e também de novas interfaces para expressão musical, né, que ia facilitar o acesso heterogêneo para todo mundo, e, e, e sobre as questões tecnológicas, elas dizem respeito também sobre é, um, um todo da internet das coisas e do uso das tecnologias, né, então os, os problemas que servem, as questões que servem para esse ponto vão servir aqui também. Okay, so basically what uh, Romul answer is that uh, in his paper he point out different uh, strategies uh, to, to, to approach that from different uh, standpoints, economical, technical, and uh, regard to, regard to uh, uh, now I forgot it, <coughs> regard to uh, basically, well, environment, uh, and sustainability. Oh, thank you, Matthew, very much. All right, then, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to say goodbye, say uh, your last, last words, and then we'll come back tomorrow. Adiani, would you like to say something for the authors? Oh, it was good to see you, so have you here. Thank you, everybody, for excellent videos and presentations. And see you tomorrow, if you are around. Maybe I'm going to see you only in the meeting. <laughs> the be meeting, I will like uh, info, reinforce on Thursday morning. We have this uh, meeting that is open for everybody to join. It will be in another link for Google Meet. You have that on your in the email. 
and we were starting just just 30 minutes earlier than was scheduled because the last one was a bit short in time. So we're going to start uh, 9.30 here in Brazil instead of 10. So we can have a bit more time until the presentation on the afternoon as well, on the Friday. Yeah, if anyone wants to say goodbye, I don't know. <laughs> And I have like uh, last word. Okay, right, thank you very much for uh, we'll, we'll go through everyone. Uh, just saying that there are more questions here. Okay, guys, we do not have the time to go through all of them, so I'm going to send them to our forum. So if you're free to to answer them by mail, if you want to, uh, Guido, uh, would like to to say your final words, please. Okay, thank you very much for this nice moderation. It was really very good uh, meeting, I think. Um, yes, and um, see you then next time. Thank you, Guido. Pedro, would you like to say something? Yeah, also thanks Thanks for the moderation, for all the interesting questions and insights, and hopefully see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Romulo, your turn. So, a vez, cara, quer dizer alguma coisa? Inglês ou em português? As you prefer. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, guys. It was a pleasure to be here. Uh, Mathieu, thanks for the partner. I'm glad to be here with you. And that's it, guys. I see you tomorrow. Right, thank you, Romulo. Matthew, your turn. Would you like to say yeah. something for us, please? Thanks to the organizers. It's really nice to meet everyone online as well, especially in lockdown time. Um, and uh, it was very useful to have the videos I found uh, explaining how the workshop is going to work. And this system seems to work pretty well. So well done for the organization and see you, see you soon. Thank you. We are learning. We are learning every day. So that's good. it's good to hear that it's working. Uh, Zima, your turn. Would you like to say something for us, please? Yeah, I would say like, thank you so much to UBMS 2020 for giving us opportunity to, to contribute in this workshop. And uh, thank you for all the suggestions and information from my as well. And I hope to see you all soon in the next year as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yosima. Uh, Damien? Yeah, just thanks for the moderation. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. And it was great seeing everybody during this lockdown time, seeing people with like minds and how all the ideas actually kind of touch on a similar topic is really interesting. Um, yeah, and I'd like to say thanks to Joan and Zima for working with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the words. Ovi? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I hope to see you all again soon. Hopefully tomorrow. Thank you. Finally, Joe. Uh, yes, thanks to everyone too for uh, and thanks to the organizers for putting everything together today and organizing such a good session and the interesting questions that came after from everyone. Um, as I look out the window here, it's pitch dark, mm -hmm. and I hope we'll actually be in Porto Seguro next year. <laughs> Warm weather, <laughs> nice food. <laughs> Not, not next year. Next year we'll be in Porto, uh, maybe the year before that. Uh, Soon. All right, the summer with the warm, warm weather. <laughs> All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, I would like also to thank Victor for our technician uh, to make this happen. Everything works. So, obrigado, Victor, aí pela pelo trabalho que você está fazendo. Tá muito bom. Muito obrigado. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you all, and see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye. 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 Victor, you can put the video. Victor? <laughs>